Can I just leave yet? Arrive Saturday and bark. Yeah, go. It's a bothersome option, but it was always going to be a bothersome option. We're going across the Sea of Japan for fuck's sake. Oh god, that's almost as bad as the Bering Strait. We avoided the Russian military ships and instead took passage on the Korean vessel crewed with a mix of Koreans, Mongolians, Siberians who regarded Monsieur Fogg with grave curiosity. Um... <laughs> Tried to dismiss their attentions, but it did little good. They continued to goggle my master in mild disbelief until he retreated below deck with the slightest furrow etching his brow. Cash reserve speed and be running low, passable to you. I'm well aware. He feels more custom. All right, good. Believe me, dude. I, I, I know, but don't worry. We'll get a bunch of money once we land in Yokohama. For the first day aboard, we kept ourselves. We kept mostly to ourselves. Um, the crew seemed busy with their tasks, and I was happy to have fewer, fewer of those myself. Um, Monster Frog was his usual impervious self, however, and made his calculations, read his newspaper. Meanwhile, his boat steamed onward. He's taking some hits. Hopefully, I can I can tend to my master soon. Um, Mademoiselle, good day, Frenchman. Yokohama. Um, traveling circus in Yokohama. Oh, that's fascinating. And we're going around the northern bit of Japan there. One of the cabin girls, Elena, spoke good English and was attached to us as a translator, though she created as much conversation as she explicated. Um, good use of that word. Um, do you know my parents? Uh, I doubt it since I've only just met you. Elena nodded. My father was a Russian officer, maybe, I think, and Mama comes from a famous Cossack family. They're all soldiers. Russian officer, maybe? Raised an eyebrow. Well, Mama met him when she was dressed as a man and joined the Cossack host. He was very surprised, I think. Elena shrugged. Mama says he died of shock, leaving me as a present. Uh, but I think he pro uh, probably ran away because Mama's so fierce. She looked proud rather than distressed at this prospect. I blinked at the little cabin girl, rather at a loss for how I should respond. That's nice, I hazard. She nodded enthusiastically. Mama runs the boiler room, and all the sailors are frightened of her. She told me rather wistfully, One day I will be like her. Elena made a mock fierce face, and I pretended to quake in terror until we both began to laugh uproariously. More seriously, a friend in the boiler room, um... I'd like to meet her, I said, and Elena giggled in delight. I will ask, she replied. I'll be taking some hits. He'll be fine. There we go, we'll tend fog. Tensions are much appreciated. It's goddamn right, you rich bastard. Elena knocked at my door unreasonably early in the morning, eyes bright. Mama says she wants to meet you. Uh, she sees my arm. Will you come? Lead the way, mademoiselle. We descended into the bowels of the ship. I felt the heat and the noise of the engine before I saw it. The rumbling whistles of the boiler, the shouts of the men shoveling coal, the thumping of the pistons and groan of metal. A woman with muscular arms sheened with sweat and hair shorn, uh, shorn to her ears presided over the activi uh, activity with well-worn confidence. She glanced over to us and grunted. I bowed deeply, as I would to any lady. Unimpressed, she spat at my feet, while Elena chattered away with an unintelligible dialect. The formidable woman regarded her daughter with certain detachment, which masked deep adoration. The girl bloomed underneath her mama's merest glance. We took our leave soon after, and Elena smiled radiantly. Isn't she wonderful? I, <laughs> she breathed. I nodded enthusiastically, and Elena uh, bestowed another bright smile upon me. She spat at my feet. Well, you know, can't please everyone. We've arrived at Yokohama. Elena laughed as I hung over the ship's rail to get a better view of Yokohama as we neared port. She gave me a hug goodbye, which surprised me, though her mother watched me with hard eyes throughout our exchange. We weighed anchor as the sun set. It lit the foreign flags of the harbor with blight, bah, bright fire as it dipped below the horizon. On day halfway through our journey, we finally arrive in Yokohama. Some of our positions should be quite valuable here, including this shit. Which was worth way more back in, um, back in Vladivostok. It was worth 400 pounds more. Son of a bitch. How's that? That's also, yeah, let's, no, hold on. Let's sell that. Get some coin. And we'll sell the buffalo hide. Amethyst. That doesn't seem to be worth a whole lot. I could sell the vodka and, um, eh, Malachite. It's worth $770 in San Pedro. Um, oh, what else could I sell? 36. Engineer set, evening jacket, fur coat. Let's keep with what we got. Um, I need to explore, um, I guess. So we can go from Manila over to, where's this fucker going? Oh, to Yokohama. In Yokohama, we can go to, there's Honolulu. Wow, we can go straight from Yokohama to San Francisco? That's gonna be so expensive! 
It was hard to believe that Yokohama had only relatively recently opened to foreigners. There was an entire foreigners district not far from the waterfront where it was common to hear Chinese or Russian or as Japanese. There were several varieties of English to choose from as well. The Munster Fog would have barely deigned to include the nasal tongue of American merchants. Um, I noticed a Jap Japanese man watching the scene with a look of intense concentration and scribbling in a sketchbook. Uh, what are you doing? He jumped and, a smear of, uh, <laughs> and left a smear of ink on the paper. He looked up, clearly ir irritated. Do you mind, he said, his accent, an unholy mix of Dutch, French, and English. I'm making a drawing for a woodcut. Um... Uh... <laughs> he was clearly a temperamental sort, so I left him to his work with a polite smile. I do not think he liked foreigners from his drawing of them. Alright, plan. Oh, God. How much is this? $4,000. And we don't even know. It's $4,000. Is Oh, man. Is there a bank? There is a bank. It's open on Monday. What else could I sell? There's no way I... Like, even if I sold everything I own, I'm not making $4,000. There's no way in hell. There's, yeah, there's not even... I wouldn't even make, like, $2,000, let alone four. Christ. All right, well, uh, let's stay in the hotel. I basically need to wait until the bank opens up. With what remained of the day, I afforded my master every service. There we go. Yep, cool. Shit strengthened. All right. Uh, opens Monday. We need to spend another night. As night fell, I voted my master every service. Sure, he had fresh tea. There we go. Opens at 9 a.m. 7, 8, 9. Bank. Uh-oh. My funds at home are not unlimited. I prefer not to draw them, but... And with that complaint, he snapped shut his ledger. I regarded uh, the bank as we entered. It was a small affair, but efficiently looked after. And we were quite... Or we were quickly seen to. Oh, man. 4,000 in a week. I have to. 4,000 pounds. I'll check with the head office to make the transfer. I respect your answer in five working days. Turn to the bank. Wait seven days. Oh my god. This is... This is risk. We had six days to wait for our money to arrive from London. So I found a room and let the time go by. Boop. The delay was a chance to relax somewhat. We woke ready to be at the bank as soon as the doors opened. Uh, when the bank opens, tapping the clock, we'll, yeah, okay. Nine. All right, let's get our four grand. We're now back at 5,000 again. Made our way to the bank to collect our money. Finances are looking a bit better now. They are indeed. No, that's not what I want. You know what I want. I want this. 18 days. In five days. Negotiate. Price is rather steep. So on top of four thousand, it'd be that much more. Nope. Okay. Um, anything in the market that's new? Nope, not a thing. Okay. Wait, hold on. How many suitcases can I have? On um, I don't want to go to Manila. Oh, it's a damn sight cheaper. I really don't. I really don't think that's a. That's a good strategy. Like. I don't think going that way is, is a sound strategy because it'll it'll still be more, so cancel. Um yeah. Just wait, I guess. We're on day fifty. Before turning in for the night, um I did some minor alterations to our clothing to better prepare us for our inevitable apology. So again no, fuck you. I want this one. I want this path. It leaves in five days, doesn't it? I just like all right, so four days at 3 p.m. So I need to wait another couple of days. All right. Keep spending a night in the hotel. Okay. Room settled in, and I went out for a little explore. Found a somewhat energetic Japanese madam who had mislaid a locket, um, which I spotted, and who told me then, uh, who then told me that some buyers will pay well for fur coats in San Francisco. Uh, I thanked her. And she smiled and went about her business. I think I've already sold that for a coat, but who really cares? Keep passing the night. With a few hours left of evening, um, I polished everything. Yep, it's cool. Uh, and let's see, how many more days? No, fuck you. Why is it automatically selecting that? 
Alright, two more days. So, hotel. And as night fell, it's starting to repack and iron everything. Ship shape for an average departure. One more day. Sweet. Before night ended, um. There we go. Yep. Okay. Uh, depart. Embark. Yeah, it's a bothersome option. That's because you're sailing across the entire Pacific Ocean. The Water Lily was a sleek, iron-hulled ship to submarine prototype captained by a severe American by the name of Wicker, who wore a top hat. And at all times, it preferred tea to coffee, which greatly endeared him to Monsieur Fogg. In addition to the... I prefer tea to coffee. So, fuck yeah, Monsieur Fogg. Tea to coffee, not tea to copy. In addition to the usual compliment, the Water Lily carried an entire corps of brass-goggled engineers and a brace of submariners on standby, should the captain call the order to... Sub to submerge. The rumor was that she had been a slave ship. A Confederate vessel. Confederate vessel. Sold off to a private concern in the latter, more desperate stages of the Civil War. But I saw no traces of a dog passed aboard. The crew seemed happy a family and welcomed us to their iron hole bosom. Wait. Celebrated maniac Phineas Fogg walking financial tightrope, says Bank. Ah, well. That, that is to be expected. I've blown through like $7,000 on this journey. It's easily an expensive route, but hopefully a fast one. Hopefully. I mean, once we cross the Pacific, we're almost home free. We just need to cross the Americas. Probably through Canada, quite honestly. Um, if we go from like Toronto to New York, and then out of New York to London, I mean... It seems like the best way to do it, really. Let's go check... Our cabin, while wholly spacious, was adequate to our needs. One of the middle shipmen came to by to show us how to use the pressure seals in case of um, submersion. But in all other aspects, I looked forward to a peaceful steamship ocean crossing. I would not be so lucky. Nope, he's taking a hit. Hopefully I can wait on him. There we go. Most diverting, my good man. There we go. It's day 55. Oh, God. I'm not sure we're going to make it, guys. The salt air blew cold and sharp against my face as I opened the door onto the top deck. It was painfully early and only the passengers awake where a group of Chinese laborers hunched miserably near the stern. One of their numbers was vomiting co um, copiously into a bucket. I offered him um, my own secret remedy, which I had brewed up for just such an occasion. He swallowed it down with a certain dubious desperation, but immediately improved in both complexion and temperament. He thanked me most profusely. I waved away his thanks and they invited me to sit and play dice with them until the sun rose. Oh, that's nice. Ah, oh, Fog's getting a little antsy in his pantsy. Little fucker. Ah, oh, oh, fuck it. I missed it. I come to you on Sir Fog to a game of uh, wits with a family of American missionaries who are traveling back to San Francisco for a family wedding. My master began strongly, but Mademoiselle Lorietta, the eldest girl, had a sharp eye and won several hands in a row. A new round was dealt. I noted Mad Mademoiselle Lorietta, um, slip a card into her sleeve. I blinked twice in pure astonishment and glanced up at her face, which was utterly calm, betraying nothing of the action of her nimble fingers. The minister's daughter was a cheat, a skilled one at that. I filed away the knowledge for an opportune moment, catching her eye to convey that I noticed a little sleight of hand. She blushed with the manufactured prettiness of an accomplished actress and raised one eyebrow in silent challenge. Her journey continued onward. I hope he's taking more hits. Hopefully I can wait on him. There we go. Thank you, my good man. I feel better. Oh, that's good. You little bastard. Um, I spent the day in the company of the Water Lily Submariners. They were all hardy men and women who preferred the dim and close spaces of the hold to the top deck. Too much sky, one of them said, squinting suspiciously. The crewmate nodded. All that fresh air. They shuddered collectively and suggested a bracing race to the boiler room. Um, <laughs> I tried to keep up, but couldn't not quite adjust to the lack of light and continually tripped over my own feet. Their commander, a short Japanese-American woman, pronounced me an utter disgrace. I decided to uh, salvage my reputation amongst the submariners, so I lifted my head proudly and suggested a drinking contest. A grin of vicious, unqualified glee spread across the Commander Davis's face. I began to think of my suggestion to pour one. Three flasks of sake later. I was convinced of my grave error. Commander Davis was apparently legendary for her ability to hold her drink, whereas I ended the evening in an unexpected embrace with the starboard bulkhead. Not perhaps one of my more successful adventures. I like purposely fucking him up. Fuck you, Passport 2. Sometimes life is rough. Greeting, mademoiselle. Passport 2, why, hello. 
San Francisco. Ah, oh, man. All right, so from San Francisco, I think we're going to Salt Lake. Um, Transcontinental Express. Yeah. That's what we're shooting for. Right? There it is. The Transcontinental Express, which will take me to Burlington and will naturally cost five billion dollars. I was climbing the rigging. Um, as exercise, of course, and not at all for the purpose of spying on the crew to appease my own rapturous curiosity when I heard two of the crewmen arguing in a pigeon mixture of English and Japanese. Um, I peered upwards, eager to match the faces to the expression of the voices I could make out. They were both Japanese, but one of them was dressed in a Western style, and the other was Japanese Hanten and Hakama. Hakama. Um, as I watched, the treasure-wearing sailor grabbed violently at his compatriot, but missed his footing and tumbled over the platform's edge. I was unable to look away as he fell. His body lay still and crumpled on the deck, but I heard his scream in my head for days after. I looked up and managed to get sight of the fallen sailor's companion, his face still and pallid. Was that guilt in his eyes or merely shock? He slipped away before the captain arrived, and I followed his example. All was clearly not well amongst the crew of the Water Lily. Fuck, a murder most foul has occurred! What the fuck am I gonna do about that? Probably ignore it. I mean, we only have, like, fucking 21 days left. This is... This is getting worrisome. I don't think we're gonna be able to do it. I mean, we have to cross all of America and the Atlantic Ocean in 21 days? Uh, I don't... I don't think we can do it. I don't think we can do it. I think we can... I think we can do the journey, but I don't think we're gonna do it in 80 days. The Water Lily's crew held a funeral for the dead sailor. I was not specifically invited, but felt a sense of responsibility having witnessed the man's fatal plunge. Captain Wicker led the Christian service with customary grimness. I was surprised by the absence of, um, the sailor's companion, who had been arguing with him just before the fall. He was not the only one missing from the funeral. All the only half the crew had come to pay their respects. Um... I suppose that death at sea was commonplace, and the crew had too much work to do. It's well healed. He's taking more hits. Fucking goddamn it, Fog. Just quit your bitching and deal with the fact that this is a long fucking journey. We're not even halfway there, man. Not even halfway there. Storm. Too exhausted to ride a proper injury suffice to say we're still afloat. As we settled down for the night, I was struck by an unrelenting thought. Let's hear Fog, the dateline! You have altered our- I have altered our watch already, Monster Fogg replied calmly. Did you not- did you think I might forget? The master, of course, was correct. With an eye such as his, it was unthinkable that he might miss such a detail. We had reached the point directly opposite Greenwich. Where the hours, uh, we had lost in traveling around the Worth were added back. A whole extra day. Fuck. A duck. Son of a bitch. Just- just- wow, we're- we're not gonna make it. We're so not gonna make it. Yesterday's storm hit us with little warning. One moment I was preparing Monsieur's shaving water to exactly the right temperature. The next we were being tossed from one end of the cabin to the other. We were only lucky or we were only lucky that the bed was securely nailed to the floor. The ship shuddered and moaned as the seas flicked with lightning. The storm lasted nearly six hours and blew us far off course. The captain spent most of the day peering at his charts, trying to locate our position. There was no land anywhere upon the horizon. Day 60, Monsieur Fogg murmured that night night's sleep. Still some distance yet to travel. Oh, fuck. We were blown way the fuck off course. Holy dog shit. Wait, why are we going to Honolulu? What? The captain announced the change of destination. The water willy would now make for the nearby Hawaii rather than San Francisco. We would make port in Honolulu in five days, and we would have to find our own further convenience. Fucking tits! Ugh! Pressed ever so slightly together, a rare outward sign of entirely understandable annoyance. This will not do. Indeed not, sir! I agreed, not even daring to calculate the delay and the expense of our unexpected diversion would cause. Gave me a cool appraising glance. Captain Wicker has re-engaged, or renegade upon his word as a gentleman, he said curtly, before lowering his voice to an almost furtive undertone. The course is clear. We must mutiny. I opened my mouth to... Oh, fuck. Mutiny. Yeah, Agreed. Wholeheartedly, but he continued without so much as a pause. See to it, passport to you. Use your natural charm, I injected brightly. Quite, he said, with the agreeableness of a gentleman who had just given his valet a nearly near Herculean task. We will mutiny in five days when we reach Honolulu. Make your preparations as you see fit. Christ. I mean, yeah, I agree. It's rumblings intensify over Russia-Japanese war. Mm. Mm. 
getting, getting scary, guys. My task was clear. I was to foment mutiny aboard the Water Lily. I decided to begin by exploiting the crew's animosity towards one another, divide and conquer, or so our dear Maman always counseled. I'm inflaming their religious passions. Gossip and rumor would be a good way to start. Well, uh, there we go. Though such passions were, by their nature, unpredictable. So I decided to desecrate the Shinto Shrine, steal the captain's wall-mounted crucifix, spread rumors among the Shinto crew member, gossip about the captain. Gossip about the captain. Planning to forcibly convert all the Shinto crew when we reached port. Some of the younger members seemed alarmed, but others merely laughed off the possibility. Fuck! Ugh, let's wait on fog. I could not hope for a better gentleman. Goddamn right! It was with satisfaction that I noted a certain increase in tension aboard the Water Lily, a situation I was carefully to, careful to exacerbate if my master's mutiny was to have any success. Integrate myself with Commander Davis and the Submariners. Who were rather storm tested and disgruntled. There are no storms underwater, the commander muttered, her hair a tangle underneath her cap. We should have submerged, I agreed. Captain R uh, Wicker risked all our lives. I think perhaps he does not trust your abilities as submariners. Her face darkened at my assertion. Perhaps you are right at that. Perhaps so. I've heard him say as much, I had, hoping to press my advantage. She narrowed suspiciously. Is that so? Why would he say such a thing to you? I nodded and winked. You do not know everything about me, I replied. Stared back unflinchingly, keeping her thoughts to my or keeping her thoughts to herself, keeping her thoughts to myself. Weird. Um, I took my leave a moment later, hoping my seeds of doubt would spread. Not really sure about this, but I've already committed, so fuck it. Mm. I had attempted to um, suburn. The obvious targets aboard the Water Lily, but wars were often won by the unexpected. With that in mind, I turned my attention to, um, the ship's artificer, a tall, rather imposing woman in a short jacket embroidered with the guild's copper lily. Artificers were notoriously neutral in the matter of conflict or civil disruption, but I threw myself upon her mercy, only to find that there was precious little of that to be had. Artificers, it seemed, were not only notoriously neutral, but also notoriously hard-hearted. Shit. Well, that didn't work. I don't think this mutiny is going to be a success. Because we're, we're getting pretty close to Honolulu. Spent my day putting the last finishing touches to my planned mutiny. It was all a matter as delicate and serious as the creation of a souffle by my master chef. Um, uh, there we go. Spread the word of my signal amongst my allies. And um, stayed up late. Ensuring every man and woman on my side was true. You have no men and women on your side. Oh, God. Oh, that's dumb. Greetings, Reverend. Good day to you. Honolulu to San Francisco. You mentioned steamships. Buenos Aires. Journey is a tiring one. Yeah, I'm not going to... Uh, like, South America would just be preposterous at this point. Oh, God. Do you know... There we go. Evening jackets in Burlington. Yeah, well, Burlington is a coat factory. I'm not going down here. That is just so... I don't even... I don't even know why I would do that. And we've arrived. All right, let's see what happens. We reached Honolulu in the dock. The captain took a small skiff to the harbor with a few of his officers, wishing to inquire about repairs before putting the water lily into dry dock. Monsieur Fogg watched the boat for a long moment. Now is the time. I trust everything is order. Um, I've voiced my doubts about the readiness of the crew to mutiny, which caused Monsieur Fogg to almost heave a sigh. Let's hope that you are, in this case, mistaken. We retreated to his cabinet, and I called the signal to arms. The water lily erupted into chaos. Everywhere was a clash of sabers and pistols. Now and then I heard the shrieks of officers' sonic weapons. Um, but I was not alone. Half the crew that followed the Shinto Creed fell in behind me, lit with a desire to teach their Christian crewmates a lesson rather than mutiny. But their anger helped stoke the fires of rebellion. The Chinese laborers rewarded my friendship with steadfast loyalty, throwing themselves into the mutiny with all the desperation of men and women who utterly loathed sea travel and longed to revenge themselves upon their instruments of torment in any fashion. They lit fires and tore up the already ragged sails, causing some welcome chaos. The Submariners, led by Commander Davis, emerged quietly. There was a long, terrible moment where I wondered at their allegiance. Then Commander Davis caught my eye and nodded. We know when it is time for change, she shouted, driving back any stragglers loyal to Captain Wicker. I saw Mademoiselle Loria to trip up one of the loyal officers out of the corner of my eye. She tipped her bonnet in my direction, a gesture of respect from one player of the game to another. The whirl of battle took me away, and not before I saw her falsify a magnificent feint and block the gangway to the navigation room. By noon, it was clear that all of our efforts were for naught, however. Muni did not have the support and the numbers required to defeat those who had maintained their loyalty. 
Captain Wicker and the other officers returned just in time to smother the last flames of rebellion. My master and I were trussed up and set off in the port. Um, beg to, or here. So it was only due to Captain Wicker's good grace that we retained our luggage. Our mutinous comrades were not treated with such leniency and were thrown unceremoniously below. That was, Monsieur Fogg said with icy precision as we stood upon the strands of the volcanic island which we found ourselves, rather badly done. Unfortunately, I could not... I splashed him accidentally with seawater. Could not disagree. They've deteriorated. I did my best, but... Yeah, 